to tell you that the, our next host, um, our next interviewer host is a woman who, uh, who has my heart, uh, Patricia Cortez. Um, I, I wish I could tell you exactly the first meeting, but I think it was really love at first, at first contact. Um, and she's a woman who is a powerhouse in her own right and a champion. She is an indigenous born uh, Salvadoran American who immigrated to the United States in the eighties. She has a phenomenal story, immigration story, um, and has put her own experiences to the benefit of others in ways that, that most people only imagine really doing. Um, she escaped the civil war and political violence coming into this country. Um, and in that process and in her efforts to heal has developed a deep understanding of trauma and, and, the, and the experiences of other uh, traumatized immigrants in, in our community and, and immigration experiences. She is committed to provide trauma-informed counseling services. She's a counselor and uh, she's also a Reiki master, shamanic practitioner and teaches indigenous practices um, uh, as part of the way she lives her life. And I would say she is really a model for me around the integration of life, life's work and, and really breathing and living um, what your life, life's purpose is about. So uh, on that note, I would like to welcome Patricia Cortez to be with us and she will interview or she will introduce uh, her guest. Thank you. Good afternoon, Elaine. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your kind words and your introduction and for inviting me to have mm -hmm. this conversation with, with uh, Dr. Sandra Bloom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't wait. Um, I remember when we were uh, doing the the training the first year for the trauma healing project and when you share all the dreams and it's so amazing to me that now it's all materialized. So thanks again. Yes, um, thank you for being part of it. Patricia was really one, a founding um, partner in establishing the Trauma Healing Project, uh, along with a group of young people that their voice is still ringing in my ears to this day. So um, I will uh, say goodbye and be nearby and listen and enjoy uh, thinking, uh, being with you. And welcome, welcome, Sandy. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Dr. Sandra Bloom. Hello, Patricia. It's so great to see you. Um, I, I don't expect you to remember me, but we met through the Trauma Healing Project and the uh, fabulous uh, training. And uh, I still remember the, the uh, sanctuary uh, model. And, uh, and I have to give you personal thanks for that because I do identify myself as a, as a trauma survivor. And, uh, and I'm you know, very aware of the 30 plus years that you have been doing this work. And, um, and especially the advocacy part and uh, changing policies and creating um, a system a system that is more aware and trauma informed. So I thank you for it. You are very welcome. Yes. And, uh, and I know that you are very dedicated in your work and you have done a lot and you are re uh, known um, local, national and international. So my, uh, my first curious question is during that length of time, what have been the, the most impactful uh, experiences that you had? Well, I think the most impactful originally really was I was running an inpatient psychiatric unit and I'm a psychiatrist by training and um, we started to realize that most of the people we were seeing in a general psychiatric unit with many different kinds of problems had, had really bad experiences, usually beginning in childhood. And 
when I reflected back on my learning experiences, which by that time were pretty extensive, I hadn't learned anything about this subject because there really wasn't, there wasn't much research. There wasn't, it wasn't talked about. Um, and I think the, the biggest impact on me was my patients and having them really teach me and my team what it meant to have experienced trauma as children, how that had impacted their development and their lives. And then with them figuring out what, what could do, what could we do to help the healing process and in a lot of ways, get out of people's way. Um, so that, that was the, the first kind of really extraordinary experiences for me. And then watching people, when we changed our approaches towards them, watching them often flourish, get back on track and, and heal and recover and then um, become advocates themselves. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for your your answer, and um, I realize maybe you want to share a little bit more about you uh, and about your work. Um, I I find it more delightful to hear from you than me reading it from a piece of paper. Sure. Thank well, um, after those experiences, you know, I started to just look at everything, at the world around me through a different, different lens. It was like putting on, you know, glasses for the first time and things that were blurry became much clearer and better defined. And, and I started to see that this wasn't just about psychiatric patients. This was about all of us. And it was about the way our organizations functioned and the way our systems functioned and this multi-generational impact of trauma because human history has been filled with traumatic experience that it had profoundly influenced everything about human existence and that most people didn't know anything about that. They didn't have a way to think about that. They didn't have um, the knowledge that was just being kind of put out into the world at the time. So I became really interested in taking what I and my colleagues had learned working with individuals and applying that to organizations because people who are caregivers are basically, I experience them and it's probably pretty much everybody on this call as part of a what Martin Luther King called the beloved community. That's, that's how I feel about it. And um, the beloved community has been suffering for a long time now. Um, our, our mental health system has been deconstructed. The money has not gone back into um, those kinds of services that care for people. They've often gone to, towards prisons and incarcerating people. And um, I just got, I, I had been an activist in college. And so, but, you know, I had, once I got into medical school and my residency had moved, you know, just focused on treating individual people. And then as I started to understand what trauma was all about, it's what's been called a paradigm shift. It's really a shift in these really deep ideas underneath the surface that inform everything. As I started to see this emerging change, uh, I, I wanted to act at a different level, at a higher level and impact more people. So how could we train whole organizations? How could we teach this knowledge to a whole system rather than keep it at the individual level because individuals, they have the problems, but they're not really the problem. Uh, the problem is the way our culture is really organized. And so 
that's been my work. And so we, uh, my colleagues and I developed the sanctuary model. And now I've just released a new completely online organizational approach that's called creating presence. So that's what I'm focused on right now is how much it was just timely. It was just I had started teaching online before the pandemic hit, pand pandemic hit. And so it, it wasn't the development of presence wasn't really as a result of the pandemic, but it turns out it's very timely because it's completely online and uh, available then for a whole organization to really get, get some knowledge and I hope have much more involved conversations. That's great. I hope for that too, um, because through you talking and talking about this shift, how how much of that shift have you seen in your in the time working? Mm. Yeah, big sigh. Um, mm. <laughs> uh, I have seen movement. In 1985, when I first started recognizing all this, nobody knew anything. And now, you know, we have um, state legislators who are telling schools they have to be trauma-informed. So that's a, that's a major change. Um, but for the most part, people don't really know what that means. Right. And and the general public is not yet well informed and members of Congress are part of the general public. So we've created this. Um, it's a purely voluntary volunteer organization right now, but it's called the Campaign for Trauma Informed Policy and Practice. And our mission is to educate members of Congress and their staff, ctip.org. Um, and that's our, that's our mission. That's what we're trying to do. And we hope now with a change in administration that there will be more positive, the possibility of more positive movement forward. There is a trauma informed caucus in the house. So anybody listening to this that has influence with a legislator federal, um, do get them to join the trauma informed caucus in the, if the house, if they're house members. Um, so that's just another, an, another dimension of the work is how do we, how do we let the general public really know why this is so important and how it's so important and what they can do. Right. Yeah. And once again, I, I thank you for that because, you know, with the pandemic and the campaign for, uh, for the presidency and so forth, um, there's many people like me who are traumatized. Yeah. And so, and uh, Trauma Healing Project, this is a fundraising and they, uh, you know, are promoting this idea that this is our time. This is our time for trauma healing. And, um, and so it's spreading this this knowledge um, in in all the the sectors of society. It it can only bring that togetherness, that oneness um, of the same information going forward. And so I was wondering, in in lieu of uh, the the environment that we are living that is unstable and uh, insecure. Um, is there any uh, strategies that you can share for those who get triggered during these times, what they can do to help themselves? Well, I think it is a window of opportunity. Uh, because everybody is experiencing this collective, overwhelming, but completely abnormal situation. No, nobody is living a norm, their normal existence. 
So in terms of strategies, I think first recognizing that, that whatever, you know, it's funny, I was watching, um, I recorded a TV show last night and I called up my best friend and said, you got to watch this because it's, it's the show called Bull and it's about a trial scientist who, so he uses psychology all the time and they portray it's the first post pandemic and we're not post but in, in yeah. the pandemic tv show that i've i've seen um that you know was a fiction and but he the character expresses a lot of what i think everybody is is feeling this sense of complete just disjunction of of our lives for trauma survivors um, I think probably th through the project and through a lot of the speakers that you're having, there are a lot of specific strategies that people can use. I think writing is one of the best because it helps us, because anybody can do it and you can keep it private, but writing is integrates both of the parts of the hemispheres of our brain and we know that a lot of things that trigger people are nonverbal experiences that happened can happen many many years ago um, and it need that information needs to be integrated in the brain so that it no longer is a trigger and one of the really simple thing that people can do is to write um, and then write about anything in any way, just start writing and it helps, it, it, it helps you then the more upsetting you feel when you write, the more powerfully healing that can be. And then anything you can do at home under the circumstances that is a creative activity. Um, I'm taking, I, I, I can draw stick figures. That's it. No, you know, natural ability whatsoever. But I doodle now and um, I'm taking a drawing course um, because it helps me to, to feel healthier and, and more alive um, and that I'm learning and that I'm growing. I think that's really, really critical. Um, and then people have to get out and walk because there's not a much exercise we can do. Um, you can't go to a gym, you can't go swimming, you can't, you know, do the things that people might be quite accustomed to doing. So what can we do? Well, we can do yoga, which we know is really good, whether you're traumatized or not, and, um, and walking. Um, my dog pretty much demands that I have to walk a couple miles a day. And that's been really good for me. So that's, all that comes to the top of my head, Patricia. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that you know, I I work in the in the field. I I do counseling for folks, and um, and I've been uh, telling people dance and sing. <laughs> so so it's a time to be creative and yeah. to discover new ways uh, that that it's going to work because ultimately those uh, strategies are very subjective, right? What right. one thing, it, it might not work for everybody. Right. And so, uh, but I appreciate this reminder of writing and how writing creates that integration that you mentioned. And, um, you know, now I'm thinking uh, early on, uh, you mentioned about how people part of the, the journey of uh, trauma healing includes people flourishing, right? And so could you share with us uh, some of the, the, those aspects of the work that you have seen on people so, so that we can all hear that number one, healing is possible. And number th two, that within the trauma, there's a volumes of resilience in people. I wanna remind people of that. 
healing is definitely possible. Um, I, uh, that is really the fuel that kept me going through all these years of, you know, banging on uh, what was a closed door really um, has been the inspiration that I got from watching the people I worked with, my patients um, who had just been through hell uh, really come back, come back as not bounce back um, because there, for many of them, there wasn't any healthy place they started with, but they moved on. They went down a different road. They took a different path. Um, they kept their feet moving, which, which was really inspiring for me. Um, and I think that's what flourishing is. It's what Judy Herman wrote in her book. She wrote about a survivor mission. And that's, that's what I think has changes the world, really. When people take all that pain and suffering and use that energy to take their lives in a different direction, a direction that helps other people and helps themselves. Um, and, and get out of that deep pit of pain, climbing out and then going down a different path. I think that's what flourishing is. And I think we have a gazillion examples of, of how people have done that in their lives that are, that's, that are just incredibly inspiring. Um, and I think hearing those stories, it's, it's really it's good for all of us um, and in whatever form they take, um, whether it's writing or TV or movies or somebody's personal story in a meeting. Uh, I think it's, it gives us all energy. It's almost like feeding, feeding the collective with those terrible stories and then the stories of transformation. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, there there is a notion that you know that there's a, there's a talk about the small T and the capital T, right? Um, and you know, and 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 then trying to to reflect and growth through my own experience and through my own knowledge, I have always wondered if the trauma is a universal experience or is it or is only the experience of a few and i was wondering what is your take on on uh, yeah. on that question yeah i think um i think what we're really talking about what we've been learning about is the science of suffering and it's really about suffering um and you know I've, I've always been afraid to, um, to categorize that. I know what you mean that the writing mm -hmm. about the small little T and the big T. Um, yeah, I know that, but suffering is suffering. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is really about how do we, how do we help stop the suffering? There's so so much of the suffering that people go through is unnecessary. It is preventable. It never should happen. Why should anybody in the world we live in with the riches that we have, why should anybody live in poverty? Why should anybody go hungry? Why should anybody be destroying the environment? You know what? It, none of that needs to be happening. Um, and, and so I, I think less about the magnitude of the trauma, which I do think is universal because of the world we live in, because we live in a world that has been so distorted in our values by multi-generational global traumatic experiences repeated throughout history that 
we don't even have an idea of what's possible or what healthy is. And what we call normal is as sick as hell. So yes. I, I guess that's my response. You know, that's what, that's what you triggered. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And, and I appreciate you. And I love the time that we have together. 